realize about Thompson, he does have a good wrestling background. Thompson. For an English guy, at least. <laughs> oh, come on. Nice wrestling has always been the Achilles heel for the British fighters. Bad or I think I'm going to choke her. By submission, you do a Kimura. Aaron Cold-Blooded! Blanch! Yeah. He's got a massive advantage on the, on the ground. Got it, but this doesn't look good. Oh, attack! Oh. Let's go and it! Got the wrestling, bro. English people can't wrestle, bro. Britain's premier MMA reporter Gareth A. Davies once labelled collegiate or Olympic wrestling as the kryptonite for so many British fighters. But why exactly is this the case? Welcome to the Gulag. The country has consistently showed an obsession with boxing and kickboxing, producing an abundance of world champions throughout the centuries and boasting some of the most prestigious specialised gyms arguably in the world. And yet, when scrutinising the sport of wrestling on the world stage, the island nation has barely made a splash in the vast talent pool we have witnessed at the periodic Olympic Games and in the MMA. Years upon years saw brutal clashes between the USSR, the former Eastern Bloc states, the Caucasus Mountain nations, Iran, Turkey and of course the United States. France founded wrestling, the Japanese have jiu-jitsu and Brazil pioneered Brazilian jiu-jitsu. But the stereotype that the British are terrible at wrestling is a notion that needs to be further explored, as it is ultimately the result of a culmination of failed initiatives, dark secrets and a prejudiced outlook. Contrary to popular belief, wrestling did garner some support in sporadic regions of the UK in the first half of the 20th century. Lancashire saw a form of catch wrestling spring up, whilst to the north, Cumberland and Westmoreland wrestling arose. These regions were home to many working class people who demanded sporting fixtures to be a spectacle which they could be entertained by and often put bets on. This is where the problems for wrestling began, as it didn't look too appealing on the untrained eye, whilst boxing created a clear spectacle. Consequently, boxing cornered the prize fighting market for the rough lower class. Now you might be thinking, what about the middle and upper class people of the time? Surely they could have invested in and furthered the sport in its development. Well, the problem was that the UK had no collegiate sports system unlike the United States. There was no university wrestling programs and those who were enthusiastic enough about the sport would be forced to set up an amateur club or society and fund it from their own pocket. But if America was able to preserve the legacy of the sport through it being included in the college system and in the high school curriculum, then what about the other powerhouses in wrestling, being the USSR and the Eastern Bloc primarily? Well, as the nations were communist for most of the 20th century, they saw sport as a propaganda tool to demonstrate their superiority over the capitalist West. They especially valued strength-based sports, and I touch upon why in far more detail in my Soviet doping plan video, so feel free to check that out. Anyway, the importance that the Soviets placed upon wrestling was apparent from the beginning. In the first Central Asian Olympics organised by the Soviets as early as 1920, Karash, a certain form of wrestling, was included. From this point onwards, the Soviet government made sure to fund wrestling programmes across the country, in tandem with a martial arts style being implemented into the training regime of Soviet soldiers. This was known as Sambo, and would eventually become an internationally accredited combat sport in the 1960s. Even a lot of modern day MMA fighters use this technique, with it being showcased by Khabib when he defeated Conor McGregor in 2018. Ben Askren also makes a good point regarding why the Caucasus region tends to be a hotbed for wrestling. From that area, so obviously they're all, they all love it, like it's a big deal that wrestling is specifically is a big deal there. You know, they do Sambo also, obviously. Um, so that's part of it is a lot of the kids are doing it. They obviously are rough tumble, tough, yeah. tough life. Getting um, a lot of fights. And then I think that also that a lot of them, it, it is a way out, right? They're, they're, the elite level athletes in that part of the world, from my understanding, are really well compensated compared to what the average person makes and they're treated really well. So people see it as a way out. Heading back to the UK, the late 60s and 70s did see a slight uptick in wrestling's popularity. The launch of the show World of Sport made figures like Jackie Palo, Mick McManus and Giant Haystack's household names. The style of wrestling, unlike the fakeness of other major wrestling shows, 
catching the boot. Cobra strike! Cover get him! Focused on clean technique and a Greco-Roman grappling form, the mantle was later taken up by a young bodybuilder named Shirley Crabtree, otherwise known as Big Daddy, who inspired children to take up the sport throughout the 1970s. Now, Britain have only ever won 17 wrestling Olympic medals, 11 of which were won at the 1908 Olympic Games held in London. But the last British Olympic medal came in 1984, when Noel Loban received the bronze in the light heavyweight division. Although Loban drew inspiration from watching these British wrestlers in the 1970s, the fact that he was compelled to attend Clemson University in the US to refine and develop his ability is emblematic of the lack of opportunities there were for young wrestlers in Britain at the time. Fast forward to modern day and the lack of investment within wrestling programs is all too apparent. For the Sydney Olympics in 2000, wrestling received a total of zero pounds investment from the British Sport Association, and this trend continued in Athens in 2004. Although the UFC had started in November 1993, it only began to become truly popular in the early to mid 2000s, which correlated directly with the lack of any adequate British grapplers appearing in the division at the time. With MMA stars like George St. Pierre, Quinton Jackson and Brock Lesnar emerging, having come through distinguished college-backed wrestling programs, there was simply no answer from across the pond. Yet, what about the anomalies, the British fighters that do display some elements of wrestling skill? The Flying Triangle, this is me perfect setup in Jiu Jitsu. Now I want to stress that I'm by no means an expert on wrestling and this is simply my own opinion. Throughout my research, there seems to be a consensus that Paddy Pimler is an excellent grappler from a submission standpoint, meaning he is more than competent when taken to the ground. But, in his losses to Nad Naramani and Soren Back, the Scouser showed a worrying tendency to find himself on the bottom, unable to get his offence going. He certainly represents a new form of British fighter who doesn't shy away from going to ground, but he's yet to fight any of the renowned grapplers in the lightweight division, and only time will tell if he can truly match the greats. In addition, one of Britain's best, Michael Bisping, has fared better than many in the UFC, partially due to a series of decent performances against decorated wrestlers such as Josh Haynes, Matt Hamill and Dan Miller. Bisping, despite not coming from as rigorous a wrestling background as many, has even employed takedowns during his fights. Granted this was usually when facing inferior wrestlers such as Rivera. He may be seen as one of Britain's best, but in comparison to the actual wrestling specialists throughout the UFC history, he really doesn't compete. Even British fighters who are somewhat revered as possessing a decent level of wrestling in their arsenal struggle against the behemoths of the respective divisions. So what is the future for wrestling in Britain and British fighters in general? We have seen more and more British fighters head to America in a desperate attempt to improve their wrestling, as evidenced by Leon Edwards. He recently attended the American Kickboxing Academy, which has produced great wrestlers like Daniel Cormier and Cain Velasquez in order to bolster his grappling capabilities. Yet, it's a sorry state of affairs that Brits have to travel abroad in order to truly perfect the craft. The lack of an organised collegiate system and the omittance of wrestling from the physical education curriculum in schools has ultimately condemned ambitious British fighters to the scrap heap when it comes to competing in the sport at a high level. With the broad consensus being that a pure grappler will defeat a pure boxer on 9 out of 10 occasions, as evidenced by recent years in the UFC, the future of fighting for the British looks bleak. In 2011, a study estimated that around 3 to 5 people out of a thousand practice Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is honestly pathetically low. But what I have personally noticed recently is a sharp uptick in the sport's popularity, with BJJ gyms springing up across the nation. If this trend continues, then we could see some talented grapplers exported from these shores. In terms of pure wrestling, I can't see the UK government rushing to implement a costly wrestling programme solely in order to increase our chances of securing MMA glory. But can you imagine the prospects that the UK would produce should teenager training in mixed martial arts also receive wrestling tuition akin to what is provided in the US and in parts of Europe and the Middle East? When you combine this with the innate propensity towards boxing and kickboxing, this move would surely guarantee some future greats to rule over the division. 
Making this video sure has inspired me to get off my lazy backside and start practicing the sweet science of wrestling. Why do you think wrestling has never truly taken off in Britain? Let me know in the comments. Also, please leave a like if you enjoyed and subscribe for more content. Cheers.